Thank you, Mark, and good morning. He is risen. Amen. Very good. You didn't disappoint me. Mark is right. Every day is Resurrection Day for believers in Jesus Christ, but we are following a tradition, an ancient tradition, and taking a special note of the Lord's resurrection this morning, and I've chosen a text for that in the psalm, Psalm 103, and I'm going to read the first five verses. That's mainly what we will consider this morning, where David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Ensemble, well done. And congregation, Thank you. I'm telling you, we have the best choirs in the city. (laughs) Very good. A few weeks ago, after Stephen Hawking died, an actress tweeted that he was now free of any physical constraints. A picture also appeared of an empty wheelchair in front of a silhouette of Hawking standing among the stars. Stephen Hawking didn't believe any of that. He was an atheist. In an interview with The Guardian, he said that the idea of an afterlife is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. So this life is all there is. When it's over, it's over. His was the philosophy of a dead end. Yet I think the sentiments expressed about him being free and standing among the stars tell us a lot about people. That they can't live with a materialistic philosophy. They can't live without hope. But the world, especially materialism, can't give hope. Only God can do that. And he does that throughout the Bible for his people, for believers in his son, the promise of life forever, the promise of the resurrection of the body and the kingdom to come. That is something for Christians to think about and rejoice in every day. But it's a tradition for the church to take this day, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, to remind ourselves of it. And this morning we are looking in the Psalms to do that. We're looking specifically at Psalm 103 where I believe we find the promise of eternal life and the resurrection of the body. It is a Psalm of David, a hymn of praise for God's compassionate character and His generous blessings. David arranged it in three parts and as you read through it, you see that there is an ever widening audience. First, in verses 1 through 5, he speaks to himself with a command to praise God. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Secondly, in verses 6 through 19, he speaks to Israel and reminds them of the Lord's compassion and grace. Finally, in verses 20 through 22, he addresses everything. Bless the Lord, you His angels. Bless the Lord, all you works of His. Then he ends in the last line of the last verse where he began with himself. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The reason David wrote the psalm isn't stated. It may have been due to a sickness that was healed or a deliverance from some enemy. David experienced that numerous times. 
But it may be that he wrote this at the end of his life after reflecting on all that the Lord had done for him, on the Lord's works, on his glorious attributes and the promises that he gives to us. And filled with praise, he wrote this psalm. I think as a person reflects on God, reflects on who he is, on his glorious attributes, reflects on what he has done in the past, what we know he's doing in the present, what he promises to do in the future. As we reflect on that and reflect on him, that, that worship and praise naturally flow from our hearts. I can really think of nothing more practical for you or for me to do than to reflect deeply on the Lord God. Because it gives worship, and when you worship, you obey. You live a kind of life that honors Him. So, David speaks to himself. We read that in verse 1. He will tell the nation to do that. He will tell the universe to worship. But first, he begins with himself. Praise and worship must begin within our own hearts. And so that's where David begins. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. How do we do that? How do we bless God? We do it by acknowledging Him as the source of all our blessings. James says that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And now David wants himself to acknowledge that with enthusiasm from all that is within him. Mind and emotion. I think we could perhaps paraphrase all that's within me as from the bottom of my heart. He wants to bless God. He wants to praise Him. He wants to worship Him. And not to forget anything. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. One of the greatest dangers the church faces that you face, Christian, that I face, is forgetting. All through the Old Testament, Israel is told to remember and not to forget. When we forget God, we drift. We don't just drift aimlessly, we drift into sin. We are to remember all of God's benefits. Now that word benefits is simply the word deeds. But His deeds are great and they are always to our benefit. And in verses 3 through 5, David gives us examples of those deeds. Who pardons all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Now that is as true for you and me as it was for David. These are great deeds the Lord has done for us and will yet do for us. Let's look at that. First and foremost, He forgives he wipes us the slate clean. He gives us a clean, fresh life. He pardons all your iniquities. Sin is always done against God. When we sin against each other, we're sinning against Him because we're sinning against His image. And we're not only doing that, but we're sinning against His commands. So he has good reason to be angry with us. In fact, David wrote in Psalm 7, verse 11, that God is angry with the wicked every day. And yet here he writes that the Lord forgives our sins. How is that? Well, he tells us in verses 11 and 12 how it is that he does that, why he does that where he reminds Israel of the Lord's loving kindness, his unconditional love toward those who fear him, and that as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Kipling wrote, east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. And that's the idea here. That's grace. 
That's why he forgives. He loves. What David didn't write here is how he can do that. And that's because of his son. He can do that because of the one he sent into the world to bear our sins and suffer for them in our place. Now, no preacher can say everything in a sermon or a psalm. And David doesn't say everything for us here, but the death of Christ is the ground of God's forgiveness. The prophet Isaiah will say that in Isaiah 53, verse 11, my servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. That's what the prophet says he, that's what the prophet says the father will see, and as a result of seeing what his son has done as a sacrifice for us, will be satisfied. His anger is removed through the work of His Son on the cross. Christ's death satisfied God's justice. Isaiah also said of Christ's death that by His scourging, we are healed. He's the great physician. And that too is what David wrote, who heals all your diseases. Now, that could be understood as a way of describing forgiveness, We're in the Gospel of Mark, and as you read through the Gospels, all through them, the Lord is healing diseases, He's healing sickness, and that's a picture of the forgiveness that God brings to us, the forgiveness of sin. But the Lord does heal us. We pray for that, and He answers our prayers. Not always, at least not always in the way that we want, always according, though, to His perfect will. We see that here in this statement in the psalm. Still, not all our diseases are healed. Eventually, we die. So I think here we have a look beyond the present and to the future. This is similar to what we have in the New Testament with what's called a proleptic arist, which means a past tense that refers to the future. Not many cases of that, not many examples, but we do have an example of it in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30 where Paul wrote, Whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Those are all written in the aorist tense, the simple past tense, even that word glorified, which we would expect to be in the future because it has not yet occurred. But Paul's reason for putting it in the past tense is to state the certainty of it. Our future glorification is as certain as a past act of history. Nothing can be more fixed than something that's already happened. So that glorification that he speaks of is certain. We have that here with healing. And this brings us to the reason for this sermon, this Easter Sunday. Healing will happen in the resurrection when the Lord returns and raises our bodies from the grave. That's the blessing that David writes of next in verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Now, the Lord does that in the present in many ways. He delivers us from dangers. He snatches us from harm. More often than you and I realize, the world, I think Calvin put it, is filled with thousands of terrors and deaths every moment. We don't see them. And he's redeeming us from them continually. Someday we'll see uh, life, I think, and we'll see how God delivered us in so many ways and how he guided us like a father does his child through this world and all of its difficulties. He's continually doing that, redeeming us. This word for redeem is one that you've heard before, goel in the Hebrew. It's a word that refers to a family protector. It's used, for example, in the book of Ruth, of Boaz. He redeemed Naomi's land and inheritance by marrying Ruth. It's found in other places. It, it, It was the Redeemer's responsibility to deliver family members from mortal distress from a mighty opponent who was outside the family, one who was threatening the family. 
The Lord does that for us daily, as I said, even when we're not aware of it. But here in the psalm, it, it has its ultimate fulfillment when we are delivered from the jaws of the grave. That is the ultimate deliverance. And again, just as God pardons all our transgressions based on His Son's death for us, so too our future resurrection is due to Christ's historical bodily resurrection from the dead, which was for us. Twice now we've had the verse referred to, read or cited, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, He was raised for our justification. He was raised for us. So ultimately, this promise of deliverance is a prophecy of our Lord, which has support from other Psalms, where this word redeem is a word that looks to the resurrection. It has that in view. One example is Psalm 49. The Lord's life was delivered from the pit, from the grave, from death, from Sheol. Then he was crowned with loving kindness and compassion when he ascended into heaven. That word crown is a word that means wreath that is woven together. And so you have this idea of loving kindness and compassion woven together in a crown. It gives a picture of God's favor and honor and blessing. So because of his obedience unto death, the Lord's crown of thorns was replaced with a crown of glory. He was raised from the grave whole and glorious. His body is a material body, but one that is not encumbered by material objects. He could walk through closed doors. He could eat or not eat. He could be in heaven or be on earth. His body is a spiritual body, physical but spiritual. He's now exalted to the Father's right hand in power and glory where He sits to intercede for us day and night. His eye is always on you to deliver you from every pit and every distress. We have a living Savior. That is the guarantee that you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, joined to Him through faith, will rise from the dead as well. When at His return... Your eternal soul is joined, reunited with your body, which will be spiritual, a spiritual body, as I said, like His, and a glorious one. And we too will be crowned with glory and honor. At that time, the promise of verse 5 will be fully fulfilled. Who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Again, He does all of this for us now, but only in a partial way. Paul says, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now that, that is the work of sanctification. That is the present work of the Holy Spirit which He does as we study the Bible, which He does as we walk by faith. He transforms us. He conforms our hearts, our souls, our inner life to the image of Jesus Christ. He's changing us. And that may involve various things, not only study and obedience, but hardship and suffering, perhaps even persecution. But that leads to glory. That's what Paul says next. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. Far beyond all comparison. There's nothing you can compare it to. It is that great. Here David says, your youth is renewed like the eagle. That's what the world is uh, continually searching for, isn't it? Back in my early school days, we studied the explorers who came to America. One was Ponce de Leon, who searched Florida for the fountain of youth. He never found it. But that has not stopped people from trying to find some way to turn back the clock. Money and effort are put into what is ultimately a futile fight with time. 
The outer man is decaying. David puts it more dramatically in verses 14 through 16 where he says that we are dust. What a description. Dust. David, the great king, the giant killer, knew that for all of that, he was just dust. We all are. The very best of us, the, the strongest and the brightest of us are all weak and temporary. He says, as for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind passes over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. That's such a vivid and poignant picture of life, one that was so very familiar to the people of Israel, because every spring the land blossoms with wildflowers, yellow, white, red, purple. It's a stunning sight to see, but it lasts only a few days. Then the hot east wind blows off the desert over the land and the flowers wither and are gone. And so it is with man. In his youth, he's not looking for a fountain that will sustain his vigor or appearance or anything of that kind. He gives no thought to that. We're going to be young forever. I remember thinking, ah, a junior in high school. I'm 17 years old. Someday I'm going to be 21, and I'm looking forward to that. But that's way out there. And then I was 21, and then I was 30, and then I was 40. So it goes. Age creeps up on all of us so that we wonder, where did the years go? Where did they go? Well, like the wind that blows over the the grass and the flowers of the field, time blows over life, and you wither. Soon you'll be gone. You are dust, and you must return to dust. And the world can give you no hope beyond that. It, it tries. I had a conversation once, and I think it's a conversation that's probably typical of the world. It was about eternal life, and I asked this gentleman who said we've been talking about with some friends about eternal life, and I said, well, what did you conclude? Well, we believe in it. Really, what, what do you think eternal life is? Well, eternal life, he said, as he sort of swished his wine a little bit, is uh, being remembered by your family. Leaving a good name. Well, that doesn't last very long. And what the psalmist tells us in verse 16 is, and its place acknowledges it no longer. Your place, your family, your town, your country will forget you. Your name is going to be forgotten. It doesn't last. That's no eternal life, but even that disappears. That's why I call the philosophy of materialism, which is the spirit of our age, a dead-end philosophy. But the Lord knows we're dust, David said, and he's compassionate on us, on all who trust in him. He guides us through this life, as he says, and as I said, like a father his child, and promises us life to come, not just a good name that's remembered, but real life to come. What the world cannot give, the Lord will. This is our future. When we will be renewed, body and soul, made new and increasingly strong and glorious. In fact, I wonder if, if verse 5, <coughs> renewed like the eagle, doesn't give us a hint of of what eternity will be like. A, a continual renewal, always increasing in strength and knowledge, glory and joy, ever expanding, never pausing, always increasing in all of that, continually being renewed 
so that we soar like the mighty eagle that flies high. Well, I'm speculating. What it will really be like is beyond all imagination. But that is what the Lord promises us here. Life, renewal. And so, these are the great promises that He has given. And the Lord is good for His promises. All of them. We are to trust Him. David assures us that we have every reason to do that, to trust the Lord, to build our lives on the hope that God gives. And David reassures us of that in verse 19. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens and His sovereignty rules over all. Is that not what the resurrection is about? Is it not why we celebrate this day? In fact, why the church meets on Sunday every week? It is because we have a living Savior who is seated on a throne. That's Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's what He did after rising from the dead and ascending into heaven. He sat down. His throne is established. It is fixed. It cannot be moved. His throne symbolizes His rule. It symbolizes His sovereignty, His absolute sovereignty. Things rise and fall here. The world is always in flux and in change. But God's throne is unshakable. And His will, certain. Father is ruling through the Son, and the Father and the Son are ruling through the Holy Spirit who has been sent out into the world and is everywhere in the world, everywhere in the universe, carrying out the will of God. That's the assurance we have. At every moment, in every place, always carrying out the will of God. Robert Browning's line, God's in His heaven, all's right with the world, is glib and naively optimistic. The world is not right. Oh, you may wake up to a sunny morning and hear the birds chirping. I went out this morning and the birds were chirping. I thought, how pleasant. And it was. Life is pleasant at times. But the world is not right. The world is in chaos. But what is true is God is in His heaven. He's on the throne. And because He is, all is right with His people. Or as the psalmist says, those who fear Him. And He will bring us through it all, through all of the chaos, through all of the difficulties. He will bring us through all of that and bring us into great blessing. Great blessing. So David tells himself, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. We have forgiveness in Christ. We have forgiveness through His person and work, through His death, His sacrifice for us, and we have everlasting life in Him and the resurrection to come. We, God's people, the Lord's church, have hope. We should remember that. Not just once a year or once a week, but every day, lest we forget, lest we forget. So, you must, you must personally bless His holy name. Ascribe all your blessings to Him and praise Him for all that His name represents, which is compassion and grace and abundant loving kindness. That's how David begins. That's how he ends. The last verse, the last line of the last verse is with the singular, bless the Lord, O my soul. Now in literature that's called an inclusio. What it begins, what the psalm begins, how the, the psalm begins, the way it ends. And that's designed to frame the psalm. But it's more than a rhetorical device that rounds things out. It's personal. 
After calling the nation to praise and the universe to join in, he comes back to himself because his single soul is important. Now it's but dust, as he said. We're like flowers that wither and blow away. But your soul is important to God. We are not just small cogs in a giant universe, forgotten among everything else. God knows us personally. All who fear Him. We are the apple of God's eye. He chose His elect individually from the foundation of the world. He sent His Son to die for them personally. Like the high priest, He had you written on His heart, your name engraved on the palms of His hands. Isaiah 49 verse 16. And He will raise you up someday. Just as He was raised from the grave, physically, bodily, to be glorified and fit for an existence for all eternity. World without end. That is the hope we have in a world without hope. And it is certain hope. The Lord who promises it has established His throne in the heavens and it cannot be shaken. But that certainty of life to come is, as the psalmist says, for those who fear Him. Does that include you? Those who fear Him believe Him. I think that's a very simple way, a correct way, to define the fear of God. It's believing His Word. Believing that His Word is true for blessing and life, but also for discipline and for judgment. In an earlier psalm, Psalm 95, the psalmist gives the warning, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Israel did that and didn't enter Canaan. Don't fail to enter heaven. Don't be influenced by the wags of our age who dismiss the afterlife as a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. There is a judgment to come, just as there is life to come. Escape that judgment. Trust in Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer. He receives all who do and gives them the hope we celebrate this day, the hope of the resurrection to come. It is coming, and may be coming soon. So may God help all of us to rest in that and rejoice in that. Rejoice in the great compassion and grace of our Lord and what He's done for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we go to the next part of our service and the Lord's Supper, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Father, do, we do thank You for Your goodness and we thank You for all that is revealed here by the psalmist so long ago, 3,000 years ago, he wrote this psalm with its promises that are for us today just as much as they were for David then. We thank you for the deliverance that we have through your son. We thank you for the fact that you redeem our life from the pit you do it daily for us, but there is that day that's coming when you will redeem us. You will liberate us from the grave and transform us into something glorious beyond comprehension. That's our hope. Life to come. This life is not all there is. So may we live this life in the present in light of the glory that's coming and serve you faithfully in all that we do. We thank You for Your Son. We thank You for the forgiveness of sins, for separating our transgressions as far as the East is from the West. We thank You for His work of salvation for us and His sacrifice for us, which we remember here in a moment. It's in His name we pray. Amen.